like to welcome those of Four Rivers who are worshiping with us today in Calvert City and in Edible as well. We are in the third week of the teaching series, Weird, and today we come to the idea or the issue of weird desires. So before I dive into this too far, I just have to ask you, how many of you, just all campuses if you would, how many of you would say, sometimes I really want to do something that I know I shouldn't do? Anybody out there that just say, yes, I'm there, I really want to do it, and I know I shouldn't do it. In fact, how many of you would say, would say all right, straight up, honest truth, I went ahead and did it? I mean, I, like, I, I wanted to do something, and I just went ahead and did it. Okay, so, so let's talk about one of those things. In my life, you guys, this is a recurring problem. We all have these different urges of things we kind of want to do, we want to say, we want to follow through with, and we know that's going to lead to destruction. We know that's not a good thing, but for whatever reason, we have this inner desire that kind of charges us toward the cliff that, you know, that, that brings us to a point of death in our lives. Uh, one of mine is sometimes my inner smart aleck just kind of comes up, you know, and somebody's made me mad, and, 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 and there are a few of those out there, and they give me so much material. You know what I'm saying? Like, like there's so many things that I think of and I can say and I know I shouldn't say it, and I know it will not be good if I do say it, and it's just right there, and for whatever reason, every now and then, it's just out there, right? When I was about 12 years old, I played on a Little League baseball team, and uh, I, I don't remember a whole lot about this team. I remember a few things. I remember that I played second base. I remember that I, have a, I had a 478 batting average, which is good, <laughs> I remember that I didn't care much for my coach, and I remember that my dad and my coach, they didn't care much for one another. I remember those things. Those are kind of the things that I remember about, you know, 10, 11, 12-year-old baseball. I was at the batting cages uh, back on the south side of Paducah the, by, behind Hardee's. There used to be some batting cages there a long time ago. And I was, I was at the batting cages, and my dad wasn't there. My coach was there. My dad wasn't. And there was some sort of an issue about where the elbow goes in the swing was an issue about the you know up or down or where the elbow goes and my dad had taught me how to bat and my coach wanted me to do it differently you know and so I like my dad's not there my coach is there and I've got the elbow in the wrong place I don't know what it is but my dad would if he were there he would be yelling at me put the elbow up and my coach wanted me to put the elbow down and and I just didn't want to listen to my coach I wanted to do what my dad told me I thought in my head I thought my dad's smarter than my coach you know I just had all that in my mind and he just pushed it over and over. He kept saying, put your elbow down, Henson. Put your elbow down, Henson. Come on, Henson, listen to me. You know, just really getting on to me. And finally, he said it. He said it. He said, oh, that's right, I forgot. You're a Henson. You know everything about baseball. And it just popped into my head. Just this thing that I wanted to say, this urge, this, this n very normal urge and I said his last name. I'm not going to tell you what his last name was, but let's just make it up and say it was Hughes, okay? I turned to him, and that's right. I said, yes, I am a Henson, and I do know lots about basketball or baseball, and you're a Hughes, and you don't know anything about baseball. <laughs> I was 12. You know what I mean? I was 12. Okay. The other thing I remember about playing baseball is that I didn't play that next game. <laughs> I didn't get to play um, because of my smart mouth. You guys, here's the deal. The, the honest truth is that saying what I said in that particular moment, that's not nearly the big issue. The issue is that there's an inner desire that was in this 12-year-old boy to get the last word. There's the inner desire in this 12-year-old boy to prove himself as intelligent and smart and good at baseball. There's this inner desire in this 12-year-old boy to put somebody else down when they hurt his feelings. You know what I'm saying? That There's this inner desire to fight back when fired upon, that kind of inner desire. And there are a lot of things that you and I as human beings desire to do, that there are these inner human nature desires. And the problem is that sometimes it's not so much the, the action at the end of the desire that's the problem. The issue a lot of times is we need to deal with the desire. Does that make sense? We need to deal specifically with the desire of what it is that's happening. We're going to talk 
today about weird desires. So say a few things with me if you don't mind. Uh, if you remember, if you want what normal people have, you're going to do what normal people do. Would you say that out loud? If you want what normal people have, do what normal people do. That's right. And the second thing is, if you want what few people have, do what few people do. Would you say that with me? If you want what few people have, do what few people do. The truth is, most people act on their normal desires. I, I, I just The truth is this. I, I think this is real. In humanity, most of the time, people do what they want to do. I've learned that as a leader. I can try to influence and motivate in so many different ways. But the honest truth is most people do what they want to do. You're not going to talk them into doing something else. You're not going to change their mind real often. You're not going to make them do anything. You're not. Most of the time, we as people, we do what we want to do. That In the end, we do. And so the reality is if you want what, what normal people have, then just keep doing that. Just keep acting on your desires no matter what they are. Just keep constantly and regularly doing what you want to do. And you will get the result of a normal, wide road life. Okay? That's what comes from doing what you want to do all the time. But a few people, some people on this narrow road, choose to deal with their desires. Choose to measure their desires. A few people choose to ask God whether or not their desires are His desires. You know what I mean? A few people choose to deal with what they want and change what they want. So that when they do what they want, they're ultimately doing what God wants. Not just doing from the beginning what they wanted. If you want what normal people have, do what normal people do. If you want what few people have, do what few people do. Let me read to you a passage of scripture about desires. 1 John 2, 16 and following says, For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and a pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. Those are the normal things. In other words, it's, it's normal to crave physical pleasure. It's normal to crave things that we see. And it's normal to take pride in our achievements and our possessions. That's, that's normal. Most people are going to do that. These are not from the Father, but they are, they, are, they are from this world. Verse 17 says, And this world is fading away. This is that normal road that leads to destruction. Okay, This world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. Would you read that last sentence with me? But anyone who pleases God will live forever. I want to talk to you about weird desires and how to get them. But before we get there, let's just talk a little bit more about what it means to be normal, okay? Again, many or most of us will find ourselves in this place of normal pretty often. The, the first thing that, that when it comes to desires, the first thing that's normal is that typically normal people, uh, they want what they want now, not later. <laughs> typically normal people want what they want now and not later. Ask J.G. Wentworth, right? What does he say? You all know this, don't you? It's my money, and I want it now, right? Okay, that's, that is the normal approach. And as irritating as that advertisement or many of those advertisements are, they work. And J.G. Wentworth has made lots and lots of money because of that. It's my money, and I need it now. You know, I want it now. I've got to have it now. Normal people do that. Normal people want what they want now, not later. They'll always put the now ahead of the tomorrow or the next day or the later. And so buying things you want instead of saving, that, that, that tends to happen. Getting what you desire now instead of waiting until later, that's what ultimately happens. And in the long run, in the long run, what we do is we sell ourselves short in the long term in order to try and sell ourselves big in the short term. There's a story in the scriptures of a young man who did this. You know the story as the prodigal son, but let me just read one sentence from that. Luke 15, 12 says, The younger son told his father, I want my share of your estate now, before you die. What a lot of people don't realize about that story is that that's the equivalent to him telling his dad, I wish you would go ahead and die. 
I would rather have what I'm going to have when you die than to have you now. I don't want to be with you. I don't want to be with, I don't want, I don't want to be here with you and mom. I don't want family. I don't want love. I don't want relationships. I don't want that. What I want is for you to be out of the picture and me to have my inheritance. I want it now. That's what I want. And we do this in our lives, don't we? All the time. For instance, I'll give you an example. I'm 38 years old, just turned 38 recently. And, and for my generation, one of the greatest realities is that my generation typically wants to live at the same status of life that they lived at in their parents' home when they graduated from high school. My generation typically wants to get married and in the first year have a house as nice as mom and dad's house was. And they don't remember what mom and dad lived with before they were around. You know what I mean? Like, I'll give you an example. My parents, I was raised in Livingston County. My parents, this is the road that they took. My parents borrowed a very small amount of money from my granddad, who literally gave them the cash to build a basement home, a small basement home. And when they built the basement home, they did this weird thing. My dad's a mathematician, math teacher, so he kind of put all this together. They built a basement home, but the roof on the basement was strong enough to hold up another story, like a second floor, okay? So they, they built a basement home. And, and we lived, even up till I was five years old, we lived in a very small basement home. And that basement home was paid off in full before I was born. You know what I'm saying? Now, uh, after they paid the basement house off, I was five years old. I have very few, but some memories of this. My parents saved up some money and started to build the second floor on this house that they had built. It has a full basement. They started to build the second. I remember five, six years old walking around and there being two by fours studded up and, and I remember electrical wires and things. And I remember that they did it slowly like they lived in the basement for a long time and I remember that my dad would, you know, he would like make friends with an electrician, you know, <laughs> for a little while, you know. And then the next thing you know, his new buddy's a carpenter, you know. <laughs> and before you know it, his new best friend is a roofer, you know. And, and uh, I just remember that all of these different buddies and guys would come around and kind of help them put together and, and use that. And, and, and I don't know how long, I, it might have taken a year or more, I don't know, but eventually, eventually, little at a time, they paid their way into the house that I remember being raised in. It probably took them five, six, seven years of a little bit and pay that off and take this and a little more and pay that off and a little more and pay that off. And before you know it, they were in a home that I loved growing up and I think of as such a great place to have had those kinds of memories. But that's not the kind of thing they like got married and then went and got. You know, they just went and did it. You know, but I remember what I wanted to do. I remember when I got married, what I wanted was I wanted for my mom and dad to think that my house was just as nice as their house. And when they came and saw me, I wanted them to think, man, look what kind of thing you have achieved. You know, look what kind of family you're building for yourself. Look what you have done. And I remember wanting that. And so in my head, I had this great dream of the kind of home I was going to have and how big it was going to be in my yard and how immaculate it was all going to be. And, and I, didn't, I mean, I wasn't thinking about how I was going to pay for anything. I was just thinking about what I was going to have, you know. And so the time came for Stephanie and I to get married. We were in college. I was pastoring a very small church in western Tennessee. I think I made $250 a week. That was my bring home. You know what I mean? And I remember our first year of marriage when we did our taxes at the end of the year, the two of us both had jobs, and we took home $13,000. It was a total income. And in my head, I was going to live like my mom and dad. You know what I mean? So uh, I could show it to you now. You would laugh at me. But the, the house we found... Uh, the house we found was um, old, and it was, it was a little run down, and uh, we had to strategically place the furniture to cover up all of the different holes in the sheetrock, you know, from the college guys who had lived there before us. The back door of the house had been kicked in by a burglar, and the entire frame had been uh, tore off, so for the first year that we lived there, it had a four-by-eight sheet of plywood drilled into the studs at the back door. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I don't know if, you know, this is just my, you know, this is the house. And, and I remember not being able to afford a lawnmower. So the first summer I mowed my yard twice with a neighbor's lawnmower. You know what I mean? Like whenever I could borrow one, you know, and, and I remember that, that the septic system didn't work and I knew nothing about septic systems. And so for the first year, I remember that I had to dig up all those tile things in the backyard. And for a few months, we just had an open ditch. You know what I'm talking about, okay? You know what I'm talking about. So here's, here's what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that, 
that, that it's, it's, a, it's a normal thing to want what you want now and not later. But that kind of thing is broad road, and it will lead, if you don't watch out, it will lead to destruction, okay? It really can. Sometimes we have to watch out for that. The next thing you want to think about, and I should give some credit, Andy Stanley, I think, wrote a book uh, and has, has taught on this particular thing, and this is actually his phrasing. Uh, he, he's such a good teacher. Uh, he says that normal people trade the ultimate for the immediate. Trade the ultimate for the immediate. Let me read to you a story. Uh, this story, just to give you a little backdrop, is about two brothers named Jacob and Esau. And, and Jacob and Esau were twins, and Esau was the firstborn twin, a few, a few minutes maybe older than Jacob, okay? Uh, they, they are uh, Isaac's sons. Uh, if you remember, when we refer to the Old Testament uh, leaders, the, the patriarchs, the, the dads of all those people, we say uh, Abraham, Isaac, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob and his brother Esau. Well, here's, here's the deal in their culture. Uh, Esau was the firstborn, and in their culture, that's good. Uh, the firstborn means you get everything, okay? Uh, some of you are thinking, I was the baby of the family, and it's still that way, okay? Firstborn still get everything, and you might be a little frustrated about that, get a counselor. Uh, I, was, <laughs> I was the firstborn, and I think firstborn have it rough myself. But anyway, okay, so uh, Esau's the firstborn, and, and it's his thing. He gets the birthright. He gets to be his daddy's successor. That means that there's no will. There's no will. It goes to Esau. You see what I'm saying? There's no need to read will because the firstborn gets the majority of the stuff. That, that's, he, not only that, he's the leader of the family. When daddy's gone, guess who sits at the head of the table at family reunions? You know, Esau. He's the oldest. He gets that. That's kind of their thing. Uh, but this one day, Esau, who's kind of a man's man, he's like hairy and muscular and sweaty. Okay, that's Esau. He's a real stud. You know, he's like that. Uh, uh, his brother Jacob, not so much. He's kind of a mama's boy. On a li- little bit, little bit uh, uh, smaller framed. He's he's very. Um, uh, he, let's see. He's he's he's. It's a good word for him. Early in life, he doesn't get things through hard work and effort. He gets things through conniving and wisdom and that kind of thing. Okay, so these are the two brothers. Esau, very strong, very tough, not so smart. Okay, so here's what happens. Esau goes out hunting, and while hunting, he's doing all these different things. He's doing all the things that Esau kind of people do, you know. He comes home, and he's famished. He's really, really ready for dinner. His brother, however, has been home cooking something called red stew. Not sure what red stew is, but, but he's home making red stew. And when the older brother comes home famished and ready for dinner, uh, his brother Jacob has a bowl of stew. He has a bowl of of stew, okay? And Esau says, give me some of that stew. I would like some of that stew. And this is what happens when Esau tries to get a bowl of stew from Jacob. The scripture says this, once when Jacob was cooking some stew, Esau came in from the open country famished. He said to Jacob, quick, let me have some of that red stew. I'm hungry or I'm famished, exclamation point. In verse 31, it says, Jacob replied, first, give me your birthright. Esau says, look, man, I'm about to die here. I'm so hungry. What good is a birthright to me? And believe it or not, in this story, Esau gives Jacob the right to be considered the firstborn for a good bowl of stew. He trades the ultimate for the immediate. Another way of saying that is he trades his identity for a commodity. You know, he, dra- he trades who he is for something he wants. Okay? He trades his birthright for a bowl of stew. I want to talk to you about this. For, this is kind of a preaching point for us as a church here for just a moment. Let me think about this. I've heard this sermon, this particular topic, preached in many ways. Uh, uh, some guys treat the bowl of stew like it, like it was meaningless. And the point of that sermon would be a lot of folks are giving away meaningful, important things in exchange for things that are meaningless, useful, and temporary. I think that's a good sermon and that's useful. But when I think of this story, and we're not given a huge amount of details, so when I kind of imagine and think about what's really going on here, I don't necessarily see it exactly that way. You see, uh, you know, 
you and I, most of us, a lot of us, we carry with us enough reserve to not be that hungry. You know what I'm saying? I mean, you know, we, we can go a meal without dying, you know? Believe it or not, that's not actually true everywhere. Uh, there are a lot of cultures where, where people uh, eat infrequently enough that being hungry, truly hungry, is a little bit more of an extreme need than what we might think of it. We think of one bowl of stew one day for lunch. And we're like, I think I could have passed on that for my birthright. Okay, But in this particular situation, what you have is a man who's been on the open country. We don't know a lot of details, but he's probably hunting or farming. He's probably going after some sort of food. That's what he's been doing. He went out to find food, and he comes home without any. So he spent a day, maybe two days. We don't really know how long he's been gone, but he has been searching for food. And when he comes home, his brother has some, and he trades his identity for it. You see, I see this being more of this, this particular teaching. You and I, some of us, we have things we've been searching for and wanting all of our life. And when you want something for a long time, its value starts to get increased and, ex- and kind of you know, lifted up in your mind. You know, if you've been going to college for seven years and you're ready to graduate, you know, like it's just, you're just ready to graduate, then that graduation, it kind of means a little more than it did in your fourth year, you know? Obviously, or you wouldn't be at seven, right? You know what I'm saying? It's like, uh, it, or, or some of you, some of us, you know, like want to have a child, and we've been trying to have a child for a year or two years or three years, and with every six months that pass, that need feels like it's more and more of a need. It becomes something that we are more and more desperate for. Maybe it's a, a, a soulmate, you know, a husband, a wife. Maybe we're lonely and it's a friend that we just want. And, and from the depths of the desires of what's coming from within us, we want this so badly. And before you know it, if you don't get it, and you still don't get it, and you still don't get it, and it's still kept from you, and it's still not there, what can happen is that over time, you can give away your identity in a search for something like that. People give away their identity in a search for a mate. People give away their identity in a search for the right job, in a search for the right amount of money, in a search for the right home, in a search for the right church family, in a search for the right friendships. They that we come to a place where we feel like if we don't get that, we're going to die. Right? This happens with addiction, with the utopian feeling of being high, where all of our pain goes away and we don't think anymore about troubles or worry or struggle. And life becomes about getting back to that feeling. All of a sudden, if we can't get there, we feel like we're going to die. Okay? So the truth is, it's not just that Esau was a little hungry and wanted one bowl of soup and he gave away his entire life and birthright for that one bowl of soup. I don't know that any of us would do that. But I think a lot of us, after a day or two days or four days or six months or a year of seeking after that one thing, that accomplishment that we wish we could have, I think a lot of us might end up giving away our identity rather than say, I'm never going to have that. That's a hard thing to say, isn't it? that thing you've been searching for, that thing you wish you could attain, that goal that you've been trying to reach, that cross, that finish line you've been trying to cross. It's a tough thing in life to get to the place where you, you might actually have to say, my life is going to be okay whether or not I cross that goal, whether or not I get that thing, whether or not I grab that ring, you know, at the top. And that's the place where Esau finds himself. He finds himself famished, and hungry for something of great value. He wants to do away with his hunger that's been building up. And his intelligent yet conniving brother uses one bowl of stew to take his identity from him. Have you ever thought about this? We say Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But do you know what we should have said? Had had one brother not traded his identity for something he was in search of, we would say Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. That's what it was 
That's, that's the way the birth order worked. Abraham, Isaac, and Esau. And I wonder, a hundred years from now, or 500 years from now, when the world looks back at us and they think of certain things God wanted to do in our lives, certain things that God wanted to use us for, certain developments that could have happened, I wonder how many of us will have someone else's name in the place where I na- our name should have been, you know? Because we gave up our identity for something else. So I ask you this question, what is your bowl of stew? You know, what's the thing you're searching for? What's the thing you're after that might cause you to be tempted to to give away through the desires of being normal, to give away your birthright, your identity. For instance, I think that if we don't watch out, we can easily trade relationships for achievements. We can easily trade values for feelings. We can trade love for sex. We can trade impressions that we could make on others for impressing others. We can trade those things if we don't watch out. We can trade a bowl of stew for a birthright. So that's normal people. Let's talk about weird people for just a second. Uh, Everybody, would you, Calvert City Edible, would you guys all together say weird people? Weird people, that's right. Weird people know that later is often better than now. Later is often better than now. Later is often better than now. You guys, I, I've done a lot of things wrong in life. There's one thing that I, I, I like to talk about, the fact that I did it right, because of the fact that it brought me a lot of joy in the long run, okay? My wife's not here tonight, so I get to talk about this one more freely than I will on Sunday. <laughs> okay? Stephanie and I met as freshmen in high school. Actually, we knew each other in seventh and eighth grade, but we met in that she caught my eye, and I fell head over heels for her, at 15, okay? She was a really good girl, you know, in all the definition of good girl. Up until that point, I had not so much been a good boy, you know? Uh, But she was the kind of good girl that made a bad boy want to be a good boy, you know? Because that's what I was going to have to be in order to have her. That's right. And and we made a choice uh, just a few weeks even into our dating that we were going to have celibacy until we got married, okay? And, and we weren't like two weeks in going, we're going to get married. But we were like, this is what we're going to do and not going to do. And we did not have intercourse or anything like that until we got married. We got married six years later. Six long years. <laughs> Just being honest. Six very long years. Okay? Now here's the deal. When we got married, we were clueless. Clueless. It, I mean, literally, if you could take out the R-rated parts, it was a comic show for a little while. Had no idea what I was doing. Okay? Okay? I mean, seriously, it was funny. Uh, but here's the deal, and I, only, I tell you this, and I, t- I tell just our entire church, the reason I share this story, for those of you who aren't yet married, for those of you who are young, for the, I just want you to think about this. Uh, here's the deal. Uh, one of the reasons now why Stephanie and I don't have to be jealous over one another is we know that we didn't give in when we were fully in love with one another for a couple of years before we got married. She doesn't have to worry about me and some girl somewhere. You see what I'm saying? She knows that she's not married to a compromiser when it comes to sexuality. And I know I'm not married to a compromiser when it comes to sexuality. And when we, when we are together intimately, she's not worried about whether or not I'm thinking about some other girl I was with and the other way around either because neither one of us ever were, you know? There's no thing to where there's no comparison going on. There's no frustration. That's the kind of thing I mean by saying that weird people know that sometimes later is better than now. Sometimes waiting is better than starting. Sometimes later is better than now. Does that make sense? Here's what the scripture says in Proverbs 16. Better to be patient than powerful. Better to have self-control than to conquer a city. Let me read that again. Better to be patient than powerful. Better to have self-control than to conquer a city. A friend of mine asked his business professor, professor, who was a wealthy man, who decided to teach business as a hobby in college. Okay, He didn't need the money. And, and he asked this, this professor, what does it take to, be, to do well with money? And he said, I'll tell you the difference between normal people and weird people when it comes to finances. It's just really simple. I heard this and I was like, wow, that's like, that makes perfect sense. He said, he said this, he said, normal people buy liabilities and then try to get assets. And he said, weird people spend their money on assets long before they develop any liabilities. And those of us who didn't go to business college go, 
What? <laughs> okay, so a liability is something that costs you more money and loses value. That brand new sports car, that's a liability. Here's what I mean. It costs 40 grand off the showroom lot, and you drive it 100 miles, and it's now worth 33 grand. You know what I'm saying? Okay. Not to mention the insurance is high because it's a sports car and it's new and you've got a note against it, so you've got to carry full coverage. Not to mention it has horrible gas mileage because you drive it like crazy, pushing it to the floor, passing old ladies in little Chrysler Nosemobile. You know what I'm saying? Okay, that's a liability. In other words, it costs you a lot of money so that you can have something that costs you a lot of money. See what I'm saying? Normal people buy those. Rich people don't buy those until they have a whole lot of money to get rid of. You know what I'm saying? Wise people, uh, weird people don't do that. Wise people spend that money that you and I might have spent on the sports car. Uh, weird people spend that money on something else that's going to make more money. That's a, an asset versus a liability. So my friend at 19 years old uh, took the money he had been saving to buy a car and he bought a rental property at 19. He bought a rental property. This particular friend, uh, he was in a fraternity, and so he bought a house that was messed up. I mean, I'll, I'll put it this way. His house payment was $116 a month. You get what I'm getting at here, okay? <laughs> you are laughing like, okay, he's a little older than me, and he was 19. So this, was, this would have been, you know, in the 80s, okay, So when he did this. So in the 80s, he buys a house, $116 a month. Then he goes to his frat buddies who all live in college, and he goes, I will let any of you that want to live in my rental house, you can live there for $100 a month. And you can live there. I'll take care of the expenses. You live there $100 a month. He had eight guys. In a two-bedroom house. Eight guys in a two-bedroom house. $800 a month. It cost him $200 a month to pay for the house payment and the utilities. And he pocketed $600 a month and had a frat house, party house to live in. See what I'm saying? See what I'm saying? That's weird. Now, I'm not endorsing all the frat house, party house pub. But I'm just saying from a financial perspective, good for you. You know, that was a way to go, okay? So by the time he's 25, he had saved up enough money, and he went out and bought himself a home that he was proud to live in, and he paid cash for it. That's weird, isn't it? Calvary City, is that weird? That's right. Edible, is that weird? That's weird. That's weird, but it's, it's a good kind of weird. Uh, so here's the deal. I got a trick for you. We're going to use these in our homes with our, with our families, our kids, and smart aleck husbands will try this with your wives. I'm just saying, I want to do this with my kids. I'm going to take this pack of Oreo double stuffed cookies, and I'm going to set my six-year-old son and my nine-year-old son down across the table from me, and I'm going to do this right here. I'm going to say, all right, son, here's the deal. You can have this cookie now, and I'm going to give it to you, and it's the only cookie you get. It's yours. Do whatever you want to do with it. Or... You give that cookie back to me, and in an hour, I'll give you two more cookies. I'll make it three cookies an hour from now instead of one cookie. Now, you make the choice. You make the choice. And we're going to learn that sometimes later is better than now. You see what I'm saying? Sometimes later is better than now. Weird people know that. I want my kids to know that, and I hope that we as a church know that, that weird people know that sometimes later is better than now. Okay? You guys got that one? All right, let's go to the next thing. The last thing is this. Weird people seek God until his desires become their desires. Weird people don't try to change their behavior. Weird people try to change their wants. Weird people don't beat themselves into obedience. Weird people stop wanting to sin. See the difference? Weird people don't just change what they do. Weird people change what they want to do. And the way that you change what you want to do is that weird people seek God until his desires become their desires. Psalm 37 4 says this Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you what? The desires of your, of your heart. Delight yourselves in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Some people read that wrongly, and they say, Do a bunch of Jesus stuff, and he'll let you have whatever you want. No. <laughs> It says, draw yourself so close to Christ that what he wants becomes what you want, and then he'll give it to you. See what I'm saying? Draw yourself so close to God that what he wants becomes what you want, and then he will give it to you. Delight yourself in the Lord. Let him become your greatest friend 
and confidant, and ultimately, as he changes you, he will give you the desires of your heart. Galatians 5.16, this is a beautiful passage, says this, So I say, let the Holy Spirit guide your lives. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature desires. Here's the thing. Following God is not about making yourself do good things that you really don't want to do. Following God is not about, let me say that again, it's not about making yourself do good things that you really don't want to do, and it's not about making yourself not do bad things that you really do want to do. Following God is about drawing so close to God that what you want to do becomes the things He wants you to do. That what He wants for your life, that the desires that are His desires, He begins to implant them into you and our evil, selfish desires begin to go away and our godly, genuinely spiritual desires become real and all of a sudden, the truly godly people that you will know and meet in your life are people not who just do what God says, but they're people who from down deep inside who they are, they want what God wants. Does that make sense? Let's have weird desires. Would you pray with me?